I'm Burton Cole, Bert, and I am the author of the Bash and the Pirate Pig series, which, yeah, there it is, something like that. Uh, so I, I am a, in real life, I am a features editor at a couple of newspapers. I'm a humor columnist, and my stories are a lot, you know, I call them faith, fun, and farm pranks. And tonight, we have Joan Benson and Marjorie Wingert. If I hope I'm saying these names correctly, and we have it's it's Becky Becky Van Vliet. Yes, okay, Becky's here. So I'm going to just let. We'll start with Joan. You can introduce yourself and what you do. Just uh, you know, tell us briefly who you are, what you've written, and 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 why. Okay. Go ahead. My name is Joan Benson, as you understand. I use my middle initial because there online is another Joan Benson, and it was a conflict when I began uh, trying to put myself out there on the internet. So Joan C. Benson is how you find me online and at Amazon and with my books. Uh, I was an educator. I'm retired. I was a reading specialist, and I had always aspired to writing uh, clean, wholesome fiction for uh, young adults, actually, uh, teenagers, because I had taught middle school for a while and did not appreciate what I was having, what I was discovering they were reading. But then a few years ago, well, as I was retiring from that, I became a writer for educational publishers. And that took me into the whole new different world of not just writing curriculum, but writing all types of things, uh, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, anything you can imagine uh, that kids would be reading. And there's a story behind that story. And that's what took um, Marjorie and I down a different path. Uh, the Lord spoke and, and just redirected. So mm -hmm. our little book, this is the first of four in what we call the Cornerstone Concepts for Kids. Uh, there are two out now, but this is the one that you will talk about tonight the most. And would you like Marjorie to introduce herself at this point? Sure. Or, okay. Sure. Hi, I'm Marjorie Wingard. I am a mom, I think, first and foremost. I'm a wife. And I started writing because I have a little girl and it was so much fun to be able to entertain her. But most of all, I, I think all of us could say this, that we want our children to have wholesome, biblically grounded, scriptural words for her to read. So sorry, that's ringing, but um, that's why I started writing. So I could make sure that my daughter had good books that were funny and and uh, filled with God's word. And that's how Joan and I got together so that we could write books that are engaging children and some of the most invasive cultural topics of our day. And that's what the Cornerstone Concept Series is about, addressing some of the most prevalent ones that are being bombarded upon our children. And we just wanna give families a way to address these things in um, ah, with God's truth um, before they get out into the world um, so that they are armed with God's word. All right, thank you. And Becky, introduce yourself and tell us uh, what, what you've got. Okay, uh, thank you, Bert. Um, I am a retired teacher and, and a retired principal, and I didn't start writing until about four years ago. And to be honest with you, I've broken the rules because mm -hmm. I've always heard that you are to brand yourself and stick with one genre, but I have not done that. <laughs> uh, my first book was a children's book, uh, and it became a series. And I'll, I'll tell about that in just a minute. But I've also written a young adult book, a World War II novel, um, which is inspired by my father's World War II uh, battles and adventures and experience on the USS Denver. And so uh, that is an adult book. It's a, you know, it's, it's a young adult uh, novel. And then I've also written a devotion book for women. And so that's nonfiction. 
So uh, I've been dabbling in all three of these genres, but I've loved each one. And I honestly, I've been asked, you know, which which genre is do you prefer? You know, which one are you going to stick with? And I, I just feel like God will have to let me know uh, where to settle. But right now, I've enjoyed all three of those. So my first book was um, a based upon a true story in my family of a little traveling skirt that had traveled around for 70 years. And um, after I had it published, I wrote a second one about an, uh, another traveling object. And so now <laughs> I just got a series of these items in my family that have been traveling around. And I then I just write a true story about it. My fourth one uh, was just published this week. It became available on Amazon and it's about a, a Christmas tree topper. Um, and it, it's about a real Christmas tree topper that's been traveling in my family. But uh, my feature book is Roxy the Traveling Rocker. And um, my children's books are geared for ages four to eight. And um, I have just really enjoyed it. And like uh, Joan, um, I, you know, I just think it's so important that we have good quality and wholesome books and uh, books that are of lovely and good report. Um, that ha That's just what has inspired me to write. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. And now I need to check about two questions off of my list because you both addressed <laughs> some of the list I have. I just want to say, for those who are listening, there is uh what's it called chat there's a chat room or a chat icon you can type in your questions there i'll be watching those as they go in so that we can ask the authors those questions but in the, in the meantime i'll skip the one of mine which is one of the questions it seems like you get is when when they find out you write for kids, you think you're ever going to be good enough to write an adult book or someone wants to start writing. So I should start writing for kids first. Right. And then if I'm then I can maybe work my way up to the adults. How do you answer that when you get that about, you know, writing for kids is just the easy, no problem, no effort kind of thing. <laughs> It's a journey. <laughs> I will I will chime in on that and then let Marjorie share hers because it is a different perspective. But uh, with Becky, I will say, oh, sorry for not having this handy. This was my first, which was written for young adults and many, many senior adults have read it, his <laughs> gift. And this was also written about a true story in my family set during the Great Depression. Um, so this was published right in the middle of, of lockdown <laughs> and COVID. So it's perfect timing for a, a new author to try to launch their book. But as Becky said, it's where the Lord placed the inspiration. Because when when I turned the corner and, and felt compelled to write these children's books with Marge, um, there was no doubt that that was what needed to be said and what needed to be done and it, and it felt like a calling we are very passionate about this mission because we believe that these will help parents to mm -hmm. arm their little ones before the ideologies that are saying the bible is not true mm -hmm. meet them mm -hmm. in the library at the pool in their neighborhoods at mm -hmm. school and so um this is a calling mm -hmm. this was inspired and um I think we have to go where God tells us to go, right, <laughs> Becky? <laughs> okay, Marjorie, what about you? You know, I have to say, I've, I've not experienced writing a young adult or a novel yet. I'm working on one, but they're so different. And what I will say is, even though you might be writing shorter texts and shorter stories, it is still hard work. The book that just came out called Let's Be One, God's Human Race is the second in our series. This is addressing the issue of racial diversity within the church, within our country. The first one is called um, God's ABCs, and that is addressing that issue of gender identity from a biblical perspective. But with this last book that just came out, 
we had to do a lot of work for rhyming and rhythm. I it, it, it took many, many, many edits. And so I would say it's it's a different kind of work, mm -hmm. I think, than when working on a novel. Um, because when I'm writing my novel, I'm not trying to make tree rhyme with free or <laughs> making sure the iambic pentameter is just right. You don't think about those things uh, when you're writing a novel. You can be free and just express your thoughts, but within rhythmic and rhyme, rhythm and rhyme, there are certain parameters in which things must fall. So for me, that was, that can be rather challenging. And I'll chime in too. Um, uh, Joan, I will have to tell you, I have your book, uh, His Gift. Oh. I've read it and I, I've enjoyed, I really enjoyed it. I think I got it a couple of years ago. And, um, but I don't know, uh, Bert, that I've ever really had someone to just blatantly say, you know, um, well, you've written children's books. Now you're probably ready to move up and, and write an adult book. I don't think I've ever heard that like in a real blatant kind of a way, but I have heard comments that there's an assumption that uh, children's books are surely just pretty easy to write. Um, and that adult books, you know, are, are just uh, another animal. Well, that's true a little bit, but I think the main difference is that children's books are just shorter, but you still have to have your arc. You have to develop your characters. You have to have conflict in your plot. You have to have resolution. You have to really know who your audience is. So if you're writing for four to eight-year-olds, that's one audience. And truthfully, you're marketing to the parents. And you have to be aware of that too, because if the four to eight year olds are not getting on Amazon purchasing books, it's the parents, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and then even middle school, you know, and young adult, uh, you have to really be aware of your audience, and what the trends are for, you know, even culture and things like that. So like I said, I think the main difference is that they're shorter. You might get it written, you know, maybe just a little bit faster than um, than an adult book. But for all of those components, uh, they are just as um, time consuming and, and very important that you understand how to get all those components into a children's book and do that well. Yeah, uh, mine are uh, middle grade books, so I have a little more room to to stretch out and I don't have to rhyme them, but you've got a shorter attention span. They are shorter books and, and you have to do all the things that you were just, like you just said, Becky, and, and you've got to keep their attention. Mm -hmm. I think in a lot of ways, it's actually harder to write for children. The adults might settle in longer to go along for the ride. Uh, you know, the 10 year old's going to get bored. You know, you can't have your, you can't go into a long, ex, you know, narrative explaining this, that, or the other. It's got to keep moving. And, and, and that can be a challenge. Um, I'm looking at the questions, so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump over to one of the questions that uh, one of the listeners is posing. It says, uh, Michael wants to know how do you self promote your work? In keeping with earlier comments, it is not the kids who are looking online for book recommendations. So yeah, that was mentioned that it's the parents who are buying. How do you promote? I know for me. I went to different festivals and book shows and stuff. And I'm thinking with all these Harry Potter books and the mystic books, the magic books, nobody's going to come looking for my, you know, faith, fun and farm print. I was surprised at how many parents and grandparents, grandparents are a big one. Yes. How many would come up to the table and it's like, I've been looking for something like this. I, where are these books? I need books like this. Mm -hmm. And, um, but how do you self-promote your work? Uh, you know, jump in, Joan, Becky, Marjorie. 
we have been going uh, to our audience because mm -hmm. in this particular series, we're dealing with difficult, challenging cultural topics. Mm -hmm. So we have been going to our audience. We find them in, you know, churches, uh, life groups that want to hear what we're talking about, the reason why we wrote them, uh, the value that we see, the, the purpose and all of that. So we have been trying to do that locally, but uh, regionally or, interna or nationally, we should probably be uh, hitting homeschool conferences, places mm -hmm. like that, that are looking mm -hmm. for that type of um, at least wholesome literature that's, uh, mm -hmm. I, I know not everybody that homeschools is a Christian, uh, but there is a large market there. Mm -hmm. However, uh, we have traveling constraints, so we're just trying to do the best we can and um, get it out there. And and Michael, um, who asked the question, don't be afraid to ask your friends or your network on social media. If you have a book that's coming out and you've got some friends who really believe in it, share with them what the title of your book is, a link to the book, um, the, the cover page to the book, and ask them to post it on their, to share it on their Facebook page or whatever social media. But um, have your friends absolutely prom promote it for you. Um, get connected to other people who have similar interests to you and who have larger audiences and you can send them perhaps a PDF of your book ahead of time. And if they like it, you can ask them to promote it on their websites, on their social media. So um, let us, I would definitely encourage you to, to utilize your social media as, as a way to self promote. And Michael, I would add to that um, for children's books, for the young ones, um, I, I don't know that there's any magical answers, but I pray a lot about marketing my books and asking God to, to use my books and get them into the hands of, of who he wants them to be in the hands of. And I feel like that's, that's very important. And like Marge said, it's just really important to be aggressive. I think with social media, that's huge. Um, I, my personality is, I tend to be, um, I guess, on the shy side, a little bit quiet. I, I, I'm i not um, self-promotional. It just doesn't come naturally for me. But when it comes to these books, I've had to learn that, oh, my goodness, they're, the competition is just huge. And if I'm not asserting myself and, and getting my friends and family to, um, you know, also promote my, my books, you know, then they're just, they're, they're going to be hidden. <laughs> and so uh, I, I do try to, with a lot of prayer, ask for God's guidance and, and get out there, you know, just get the word out and not, not be shy about it. Mm -hmm. For my um, World War II novel, which really is a, a young adult novel, um, that one's a little different because it's inspired by a true World War II story about my father and what I've t done with it is I have put together a presentation mm -hmm. for the character traits of the greatest generation. And then I've been using my book to give these presentations in high schools. So like Marge said, just finding your audience and meeting them, going right to where they are. I just did one this morning, actually. I live in Colorado Springs, but I traveled up to Denver uh, mm -hmm. to speak to a school group uh, just this morning about my my book and I don't approach it like you know I'm not it's not to sell it but it's really to get the message out about patriotism and sacrifice and teamwork um, those those character traits that we learn from the greatest generation well when all of a sudden done at the end these kids were asking where can we buy your book <laughs> and so but anyway that's just if you have any kind of a book, um, young adult, middle school, children's picture books, if you can get into schools, homeschool groups, mm -hmm. uh, church groups, you know, you know, things like that. Um, I think that's just a, a real good way to market and, and get right to the audience. So you can personalize 
your book and, and talk about maybe the story behind the story and things like that. One other little thing that Joan and I recently learned about, and it might be helpful for you too, is if you find there are uh, Christian bookstores out there, whether it's online, like christianbooks.com, many of these places, if you have a friend or two, like two people request for them to carry your book, they will reach out. Some of them will reach out to you, get information on your book, and will carry it because they, these organizations, these online bookstores want to carry Christian books. And so just have people request them for you. That might be a, another small little thing that you can do as well. Um, and don't don't be afraid to look out for those larger organizations like there are like grandparents we've been talking about or a wonderful group. Um, there's a, there are big grandparent conferences um, and you can contact them and say, hey, will you carry my book during the conferences? And again, they'll reach out, they'll get information and let you know if they will or not. So those are some other ways you can maximize opportunities. For me, I have found out that I have gotten into schools. I have these talks on writing and I, I go in, teachers will bring me in and I, I just talk about the art of writing. I happen to have my books with me. Um, <laughs> but the thing that I have found odd or just uh, really, it's a God thing. I've been getting into public schools. I hardly ever get into a Christian school the where my I thought my market would be, but where I thought I would be silenced, those are the schools that are asking me to come in and talk to the students about the the craft of writing. And it's like, well, thank you, Lord. Wow. And then uh, I think it was Becky mentioned uh, the homeschool. Some, um there is a homeschool curriculum writer named Carol Kinsey who was putting together uh, a course on uh, what reading and writing with worms. It was aimed at reluctant readers. And she used, she found out from her own homeschool experience that the boys who didn't want to read would read my books because of the silliness of it and, and boys being boys kind of stuff. So she put mine in a curriculum. We started going to some of the homeschool conventions here in Ohio, Columbus and Cincinnati, and like, wow, that that's really a good place to get out there. Um, you know that these are people who are coming in and they are looking for this material. So um, I have to answer Carol back here. She just sent me an email about uh, the homeschool route for next year so <laughs> time to get geared up again mm. um okay uh well i'm looking i don't see uh, another question right up here but um how about i was wondering how do you do your research and i think you've all you've all touched on this a little bit but when you're writing, you kind of have to get into the kid's frame of mind. Do you get in your little way back machine, you know, have Mr. Peabody take you back to when you were a kid? But things are so different now. You know, how do you connect with your audience? How do you do the research? Uh, do you just hang out at playgrounds and eavesdrop and try not to get arrested or... Uh, <laughs> How, you know, how do you do it? <laughs> do you want to answer that? Well, first, I will speak for my humble co-author here. She is a reading specialist. And so for her, okay. she has, she knows quite well um, the, the no. vocabulary um, to be able to reach certain age levels. And there are dictionaries out there actually that will help you know this word is a fourth grade level word, a sixth grade level word, or a second grader word. Um, I just thank the Lord for Joan because um, I can use, I get carried away, I can use big words and she, she goes right in there, she changes it, she makes it more accessible. <laughs> 
for children. Um, and so I know that's part of her training. So I, I know she can speak to that better than me, but there are resources like the children's dictionary that will help you um, keep it at a level that young children will understand. I think also um, Marjorie's downplaying her role as a parent, but she's uh, living with a nine-year-old right now. And so well, she okay. <laughs> kind of is in touch with what kids are thinking and feeling. Um, for me, it did come through my educational background, mm -hmm. I think, but um, I didn't tell you the story about how I felt compelled to mm -hmm. get into this. And I don't know if this is a good place to do it or not, but um, two summers or three summers ago now, mm -hmm. Uh, I was going to be writing for third graders and just, and I said, I don't want to do the curriculum. I want to do the creative part. So they said, okay, fine. You can just do stories for third graders. And um, in the middle of my guidelines the night before I was to start writing, there were five pages of gender identity uh, details. And then I was to incorporate those characters into my stories for third grade. I, I didn't take the job, but God turned me another direction because I saw the parents don't even know what's going on. And these children are reading this material that is totally um, normalizing these behaviors that biblically mm -hmm. are not being, uh, it, it, anyway, you get the picture. Yeah. So that's when we started to write, how do we do this? How do we help our children to grasp God's truth before they get hit with all of this stuff that's coming at them? And it's just as with us, with putting on the armor of God, only little ones can't do that for themselves. So we, we consider, you know, our little books starting at lap reader stages, they will get the big ideas that Jesus made them special that they have a plan and a purpose. Um, and then as they grow, we, we have kind of a large span. We've developed parent guides to help the parents to drill down a little deeper. They want to go to scripture. It's a parent-child devotional and with key questions and discussion items that parents can use depending on their interest in taking the topic a little deeper. But anyway, that was... How we got into this, uh, the topics are um, relevant to today, racial diversity. How do we deal with that in love, according to God's truth? The, he gave us a beautiful design in the body of Christ, the oneness of the body of Christ. We can't, you know, take off the ear because we don't like the way it looks. Um, that's the analogy that runs throughout. And with this one, it's basically, you know, God created you. He created you in a very special way. You are important the way he made you. And uh, it is confirmed throughout. So I did get off the track a little bit, but the fact that um, my educational background mm -hmm. helps me uh, to write, I don't think everybody has to have an educational okay. background. And there are resources. So look for those resources. So talk to teachers and talk to children. There's got to be children somewhere around you. Be somewhere. Yes. And don't be afraid to have other little children read your stories. They will tell you, I don't know what that means. Or you'll see how they laugh um, when it's read to them. Or you will see what connects and what doesn't connect. So I think some of our best alpha readers and beta readers are our children themselves. I would agree with that. Uh, I've been very fortunate that my illustrator has five children. And uh, when she gets my uh, my draft, my manuscript, and of course I'm working with the, the editor as well, but we become a team. But my illustrator will, she'll take my manuscript, which has already really gone through editing, and she'll read it to her children. And she'll come back and say, you know, my son just thought this sounded kind of weird or, or he or my daughter suggested you add this. And, you know, and I always appreciate that. And it it's just another little um, tidbit to to refine. And I, I've been blessed with a lot of grandchildren, too. And so I will take my 
my rough drafts and, and read to my grandchildren and get their input. And I think that's like Marge said, just a, a great thing to do. And then I'm a member of ACFW, the national chapter, and also my local Colorado Springs chapter. And I just really appreciate and enjoy rubbing elbows with mm -hmm. other children's book authors. And I learn a great deal from them for the that research part of it, Bert, that, that you asked about and and our marketing. And, you know, I just, I've grown up a, a great deal and learned quite a lot just from other authors. We're about 10 minutes away from finishing up here, but what you were just talking about rubbing shoulder or rubbing elbows, you know, like, yeah, I'd like to be sitting around the table with all of you for another couple hours to just <laughs> talk shop here. Um, mm -hmm. A couple of questions to try to get to as we're going. Um, Sarah asked, do children's eBooks sell well or are print books still king? And Dwight wants to know how effective are audio books with children? I don't have any audio books, so I can't really speak to that. Um, my books were published through B&H Kids, and it seemed like, in my case, the uh, print books did so much better than the e-books. But now they've taken, you know, I'm, I'm the e the print books have slowed down, and the e-books are still selling. So I. I don't know. What's your experience? You know, I don't know that I have any statistics. And, and I think both of those are great, great questions. And yeah, I, there's probably some data out there that would tell us, you know, this uh, this is getting bigger and it's bypassing like the print books or, or whatever. But right now, just from in my own circle and hearing feedback from other authors, what I'm hearing is that all of those are still good. Uh, print books are never going to go away. Not not with adults, not with children. They're always going to be around because we just naturally like to hold something in our hands. And so um, I, I do I do believe print books for children will, will just always be around. Mm -hmm. However, um, kids these days are on tablets and they they take trips on the airplane and moms are whipping out these tablets from their diaper bags and okay. and carry-ons for these kids to have books to read on airplanes or in the car you know and on a tablet and so that that's pretty big you know and when it comes to audiobooks i know there's a lot of parents out there that that like those too to stick a cd in the car or yeah. whatever, you know, when they're traveling so their kids can listen uh, to books. So like I said, I'm, I'm just not sure what the most current data is on which one is the best or the biggest. But right now, what I've been hearing is that all three of those are are good. I agree. Okay. My yeah. print was out selling the audio like 10 to 1 probably. I mean the ebooks print was out selling the ebooks like 10 to one. Probably. I don't have the stats right in my head. Um, but yeah, I'm listening to auto audio books all the time. I'm, I've got a book going in the car almost all the time. Um, okay. Uh, Joan and, and Arch. I will say Joan and I were very surprised how well the ebook sold. Um, we don't have the numbers in front of us either. And the print books, I believe, sold more, but the ebooks did quite well. And okay. we were very surprised at that. So it's definitely um, a, a, a medium that people are using. And one plug for audiobooks um, I'm blind. So audiobooks are not only good for those who are driving or uh, for those who might be in different situations, but it makes your book accessible to those who might have other uh, disabilities um, and can be utilized in other ways. So I'm thumbs up for audiobooks just for my own personal experience here. Okay, Linda says... My grandchildren are all readers, but also very much are addicted to audiobooks. Mm -hmm. And it's 
Now, like my first one came out in 2013, so 10 years ago. I think there's been a huge, uh, you know, difference that the audio is picking up a lot more, you know, over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. I, th I can see where, you know, how busy parents are, especially working parents with both of them juggling, that they might, you know, take take advantage of the audio book. Here's your book. <laughs> Listen to it. And I'll be back to tuck you in in a minute. <laughs> so there's um, between the commuting, like you're talking about riding in the car, um, on the plane, all these um, e-books are making reading more accessible. Mm -hmm. to the lifestyle that people are living. Okay, and, and one of our hosts, Yolanda, I think, notes that libraries buy kids e-books. Oh, so, you know, didn't know that. you can check out an e-book. I, I, I know I haven't done it yet. I get the audio books, but I haven't done the subscription where I can download a book. But, okay. When you're what your books, how much of what you put in there is you? I mean, how much has happened to you? Are you writing? And and, and I know we Becky's got all the traveling stuff, and I mean that is her family. But are these adventures that your characters are experiencing? Are these adventures that you experienced, or is this uh, you know? pepperoni too late at night and just all these weird thoughts are going through your head what what's what's real and what's just you know your your imagination well for me I'd have to I'd have to say a lot of imagination for the for my young children's books not not so much for my young adult but for the picture books yeah uh I like I said I've had these items in my family that have traveled around and so I've written in stories about them, but they the stories are really kind of whimsical, I would say, in nature, uh -huh. with a lot, lot of imagination. Um, the one that just got published this week, it, it's about an angel tree topper, but this it the angel tree topper is magical. She sings at night to the children when no when no one is paying attention and <laughs> that kind of a thing. So yeah, uh, a lot of imagination and fun, fun, whimsical plotting, I would say, for me. I would say that our little characters for the children's books are very much the same. A lot of imagination. We wanted it to be lively. We wanted it to, to carry the message, but still be entertainment. Uh, with this book being young adult and also based on my family story, my, my mom's story, actually, um, I know that there was a whole lot of me in the main character, along with my mom. So uh, it was kind of a mixture. So I think you do, I mean, you draw on your personal experiences. Mm -hmm. um, do you have anything you want to add to that? Not really. I mean, I think it's it's that combination of great imagination and creativity. And if we bring ourselves into it, we also dress that up. Um, I do have one book that was, uh, published before this and it was a children's book and that was based upon a real character experience which was a hilarious individual um, who was like a modern day hippie drove around in a VW bus played the guitar was in the army and walked around barefoot to the average person that sounds like an imaginary person but this is a real person with these real adventures so I, I think it's a little bit of both sometimes in in mine you know they're minor middle grade um, I call them like faith, fun, and farm pranks. They're based on farm, but it's loosely based on stuff that my cousins and my siblings and I got into growing up on a farm. And I like to tell people in my talks that half of the things in these books really happened mm -hmm. and half are made up. And I don't want to <laughs> tell you which half is which because mom <laughs> hasn't found out about everything yet. <laughs> But the truth is, mom remembers more of it than I do. But, uh, yeah, okay. I think we're just about out of time. If the authors want to stick around and look in the chats, if people want to add more questions, 
if you want to keep doing, maybe we can hang out and type answers if anybody has anything else. But other than that, we're about to get booted out so that there's room for the next session, uh, the next panel, which I forget which, which panel comes next. But, but thank you very much, Joan and Marge and Becky. It's, like I say, I would like to, I'd like to sit around with all of you and just. And just <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it would be. Thank you, Bert. Thank you, Bert, for moderating. We appreciate it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank for you. Coming. Yeah, thank you all. You